Hello once again, everyone, and welcome to the Generations Bible Study of St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Ken Jobst, and we're continuing a study that we began uh, several weeks ago. It's a study of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Hebrews chapter 12, which runs from verses 1 through 29. Let's take a look at the entire chapter today. Uh, I would like to call particular attention to these opening two verses, because these opening two verses are going to really set the tone and the theme for the entirety of chapter 12. Here's what it says. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it really sets the tone, it sets the theme for this study and for this chapter. And the basically, if I could put this in my own words, what we're talking about here is a Christian attitude of never give up on the life of faith. Keep on keeping on. And so uh, today, as we go through chapter 12, we're going to see this theme get reinforced again and again, that the, the Christian life is going to be a life that is not necessarily easy. It's going to require some, some fortitude to be able to press forward and to to keep going. And in these opening two verses, the author is, is making this statement in light of having just delivered all this information from chapter 11, which is the, uh, the, the Hall of Fame chapter, the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews, in which all of these different individuals who, who uh, accomplish these things by faith. So apart from faith, yeah, it's impossible to please God. Faith is, you know, faith is the core of the Christian experience. It's where the Christian experience begins. Now, chapter 12 opens with that remarkably important word, therefore, which is an indicator of causation. Since we have, right, listed in chapter 11, since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, then what we need to do, and, and watch this, by the way, I'm, I'm reading from the New King James Version. The New King James Version uses the phrase, let us. Let us lay aside every weight. Now, as I've said in earlier studies, the book of Hebrews is largely laid out as an alternating uh, set of exhortations, which means encouragements, and warnings, where the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, watch out for this. But the encouragements typically, or the exhortations, typically come introduced with the words in the New King James, introduced with the words, let us. Us. So when you see those words, let us, that's an exhortation. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Now, there's a, there's a race, right? There is a race that's set before us and it is not a sprint. It's a long race. It's a marathon. And in order to run this marathon, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying this. Look, you've got to set aside anything that is going to be a weight or an encumbrance. Because that's, that's not for you in a marathon. Now look, I... And I <laughs> Here's an old joke. How do you know if someone has run a marathon? 
The answer, they'll tell you. And so I'm, I'm subject to that, to that same, uh, same principle. Um, back in 2004, I, I ran a, a few marathons. I ran three marathons, 26.2 miles. And in running those marathons, it's remarkably important to lay aside everything you don't need. You don't need to bring the collected works of Shakespeare with you on a marathon. You know, you don't need a book that's going to, to weigh, you know, 14 pounds for you to keep busy during the marathon. So lay aside that weight. Lay aside things that would easily ensnare you, which is another way of saying, you know what, tie your shoes so you're not going to trip over your shoelaces. So don't try to carry excess stuff in this race, right? Let us lay aside every weight because it's not as important as finishing the race. The most important thing about a marathon is finishing the marathon. Most important thing about the Christian faith is not giving up. Don't, don't throw in the towel, right? Keep a going. That's what the author of, of Hebrews is telling us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's not a race about speed. It's a race about endurance. And here's how you run a marathon. You pick up one foot, you put it down. You pick up the other foot, you put it down. You pick them up and you put them down. Repeat as necessary. Now, how do we do this? Verse 2 tells us we do this by looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And, and watch further. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, right? D not, not worrying about the shame part of it, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is telling us that Jesus endured the suffering of the cross because he was able to see it and understand it in the light of the joy that was set before him. Now, we're called by the writer of Hebrews to look to the example of Jesus Christ. He endured because he saw what was ahead. He went through some things because he recognized the value of the destination. So, let's look in verses 3 through 11. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, just as an aside, that's from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. We continue in verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Now, well, I, I just, just want to comment here very quickly, right? You never saw me go run out in the yard to discipline the neighbor kid. Why? The neighbor kid ain't my kid. I don't discipline the neighbor kid. Na neighbor kid wants to do what he's going to do, the way he's going to do it. That Seriously, that's not my concern, right? So the, the, the father only chastens his own kids. Now, what's that say? When our heavenly father chastens us, it's evidence that we are children of our heavenly father. Let's continue in verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection 
to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, note, chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, the author of Hebrews here is telling us that, look, in your Christian walk, in your Christian experience, chastening is an indication of sonship, son, sonship, daughtership of the Lord. And kind of the, the, the flip side of this is, you know what? Be careful if you do not experience chastening of the Lord. If you do not receive the, the discipline of God, that then that's something, that's something to do some soul searching about. Now, what do I mean here? What? Watch, watch. Uh, there are some things because of my belief in Jesus Christ that I let go. You know, there are some things that others might do that. That's up to them. But for me and my Christian walk, I've got to say no to some things. Uh, why is that? Well, maybe I've tried some things and I realize, wow, that's wrong. That, that's, that's contrary to what God wants me to be doing with my life. Now, that if, if you go through life without ever having an inkling that uh, God is disciplining you or calling you back to a particular path or, you know, chastening, you know, you ever get a paddling because you did something or spoke out of turn, did something crazy, right? If our earthly parents do that because they love us and they want us to be doing the right thing, how much more so our heavenly Father. So, the purpose of God's chastening is that we be partakers in God's holiness. What does holiness mean? It means uh, a, a, a partness, that you, you're special, you're set apart for a special use. Now, I want to make it very, very clear here that we, we don't rejoice because of trouble, right? We're not saying, hallelujah, I got hurt. You know, it, it's not like that. No, we, we rejoice because what God will do in our lives because of the trouble that comes because we are, you know, of, of the Lord. So it's not that we're celebrating because we're in trouble. We celebrate because of what God is going to do, the transformational work that God will do in our lives as we go through the trouble, as we learn righteousness. Um, the, the, how, how do we put it in verse 11? Afterwards, it yields that peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's what we're looking at. Verse 12, therefore, there's that word again, therefore. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Now, once again, right? There's the second therefore. We've got a therefore in verse 1 and a therefore in verse 12. So all of this, what, what's happening here is we're getting a very carefully constructed argument. And the, the argument goes like this. Look, we're, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We have a cheering section. Uh, those of the faith who have gone on before, it, before us form this great cloud of witnesses, and they see what we're going through. And they are there to cheer us on. Now, they want us not to get ensnared. They want us not to be trying to run a marathon carrying, you know, uh, carrying a 50-pound weight. That, that's, that's going to be so discouraging. But once again, verse 12, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that, so, so that which is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. And, and here, um, 
you know, by, by the grace of God, back in my running days, which were more like jogging days, back in my jogging days, I, I seldom, if ever, incurred an injury. I, I mean, I injuries were very, very rare. And, and I mean, I, I jogged for, a, you know, for several years. I jogged for probably 20 years with, without any real injury to speak of. Now, what, what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that as we're in the race or when we're in training for the race, right, we may recognize some aspects of our life where we need to be strengthened or some aspects of our, our pace or our gait or however you want to describe it. Uh, we, we need to strengthen the hands which hang down. So we, we need to develop different aspects of our person to be able to run with endurance the race that's before us and those feeble knees, right? Now, and make straight paths for your feet because watch, watch this, very important because we don't want that which is lame to be dislocated. We want it to be healed. You know, my, my wife had uh, knee replacement surgery and the physical therapy that follows knee replacement surgery is one of those things, ooh, let me tell you, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's, it brings about some hurting, but the hurting is for healing. The hurting is not for harm. And it's a similar situation with, with our walk with the Lord. There may be some things that we need to adjust. There may be some things where we're limping a little bit, but that the exercise that follows that limping is designed not to dislocate us, but it's designed so we can be strengthened. Now, I know sometimes, oh, let me tell you, that physical therapy, that can be a rough and long road, road to go down, but it's designed to improve our, our lives. So it's about strengthening and straightening. We've got to strengthen, strengthen the hands which hang down and make straight paths for our feet because we don't, we don't want dislocation. It's not about dislocation. It's about healing. It, there may be some hurt, but it's not about harm, right? Let's continue in verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now, pursue, in, in this race that we're running, what, what are we running after? We are to pursue peace and holiness. Now, that, that peace, that shalom, we're, we're, we're to pursue wholeness in our lives, pursue that shalom, uh, but also to pursue holiness, that we're set apart not for our own purpose, but for the purpose of of God, holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And we get a warning here, don't we? The warning is this, don't get tripped up by a root of bitterness. And, I, you know, using the athletic metaphor here, using the running metaphor, because we're talking about running a race and laying aside any weight and encumbrances and all these. So, so the writer of Hebrews is, is writing this from the perspective of running a foot race, running an actual race. And he says, look, be careful. Don't get tripped up by a root of bitterness. And I'm, I'm thinking just of, you know, just a tree root that comes up through the, through the ground. You may be running along on a path. And let me tell you, sometimes when you're running distances, you don't pick your feet up real high, right? Because you, you, you move them along you, you want to have a gliding gait. You don't want to be, you know, stomping along. So you don't necessarily pick your feet up real high. 
And that makes us vulnerable to those roots, right? Tree roots that may be poking up above the surface. And the author of Hebrews is referring here to a root of bitterness. You know, bitterness is one of those subterranean emotions. You might not know you have it until it pokes its head up above the surface. And, and sometimes there's different things. We all have different triggers about what can trigger bitterness in our lives. Sometimes it's around a disappointment. Sometimes it's around what somebody said to somebody. But that root of bitterness can, can like poke up. And when it pokes up, if you're the runner, it's easy to trip over it. And when you trip over it, you're not getting closer to your destination. You're actually losing the race when you trip over a root of bitterness. And the illustration that the author of Hebrews gives us with respect to this root of bitterness is none other than Esau. Esau, who comes in and, watch, despises his birthright. He's been out, he's been out in the field, he's been out hunting, yada, yada, whatever, comes in and uh, Jacob's got some bean soup on the stove and, you know, uh, <laughs> he's hungry, he's famished and, and Esau says, look, give me some of that soup. And Jacob says, well, I'll give it to you if you trade it to me for your birthright. Now, I know you can go to Kroger and you can buy a pound of lentils for about a dollar right now, right? And a pound of lentils is more than you could ever eat, uh, you know, all, all at once. So basically what this is saying is that for maybe, you know, at the most, 25 cents worth of lentils, Esau sold his birthright. He let it go. He figured, you know what, the old man ain't anything to me. This, this little one-horse town, this little one-horse place, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm just going to treat my birthright as though it is nothing, uh, you know, as it's, as it's less than a bowl of soup. And I got to tell you what, mm -mm -mm, Esau made a mistake there, didn't he? Because he traded away his birthright. Watch, watch, watch. He profaned his birthright. And that word profane, related to the word profanity, right, is is a Latin word, which is a compound word, and it, it means to take something out of the temple and to put it out in front of the temple. Now, what's wrong with that? No, no, no. It, it's taking something that belongs in a holy place and taking it out and putting it in a common place. To profane something means you're taking something special and you're treating it like it's not special. Taking something holy, you're treating it like it's not holy. Taking something that is, is God-given, and you're treating it as just a, another, you know, whatever. So Esau treated his birthright as a common thing. And, and watch what happened. Verse 17. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now watch. Does this mean that, that somehow or another Esau was uh, wanted to repent and couldn't because, you know, some reason? Well, watch. It's like this. It's not that he couldn't repent. It's that there are some things in life that once they happen, they are irreversible. And so the assignment of birthright was treated in that day as something that was irreversible. You know, so we, we've got the, the blessing and the birthright. They both get swapped. They both get switched. And that's something that, okay, once it's out there, it's out there. You know what else is irreversible? When you say something to somebody, you can never get those words back, right? It's, it's always, whoops, it's out there. And you know what? Maybe you were drunk, maybe you were mad, maybe whatever, whatnot, but somehow or another, what was said got said, and it is absolutely impossible, hear me, hear me, hear me, to take that back. So that's another example 
of finding no place for repentance. How am I, how am I going to repent for something that it's impossible to repent from? Now, but by the way, so that's not, that's not talking about spiritual repentance. Maybe in his heart, maybe he, you know, oh, Lord, I wish I hadn't have done that. Well, that's a spiritual thing. Just because you get spiritual repentance doesn't mean it fixes everything in the world of time and space, right? Uh, there are still consequences. There are still temporal consequences. There are still, you know, here and now consequences for mistakes that we make. Now, God always forgives. As we seek forgiveness, God always forgives. Nature never forgives. That is, if, if I decide I want to jump off the Humana building and, and then halfway down I repent, oops, sorry, maybe did the wrong thing. Nope, nature will never forgive you. So God always forgives. Nature never forgives. People, sometimes they forgive and sometimes they don't forgive. So let's continue. Let's continue in verse 19. Um, and, and this, uh, verse 18, rather, Th this passage I, I find particularly uh, powerful. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, uh, but what, what we have here, th this is the story of two mountains. We're referring to two different mountains. There is verse 18, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire. That we're referring to Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai is the emblem of the law, right? And, and Mount Sinai, remember, was characterized by, you know, fire and blackness and darkness and tempest, the sound of the, the trumpet and the sound of the voice. It was terrifying because it was about the deliverance of the law, right? So it was terrifying. Moses says, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. So there's that mountain. But you have come to not Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion, which rather than being terrifying, Mount Zion is inviting. It's the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. There's an innumerable company of angels. There's the general assembly and church of the firstborn registered in heaven. You know, all of these things are inviting. The law is terrifying. Mercy and grace are inviting. You've got the heavenly Jerusalem. And once again, this is, is congruent with what we see in the book of Revelation. John the Revelator, uh, in his vision from the island of Patmos, tells us a very, very similar thing. The city of the living God. And there it's the place where we find Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling, but remember, remember, who sprinkles the blood? It's the high priest. The blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What did the blood of Abel speak? It, it, the blood of Abel, remember the very first martyr, cries out from the ground, right? That, so that blood cries out. Cries out for what? Well, cries out that something be done, Right? Cries out for vengeance, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Verse 25, let's continue. 
see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shall shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, whoops, here's the third therefore, right? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Oh my goodness, that, that, that's a powerful passage, and the depths of which, right, uh, we, we, there's a lot of, there's a lot of precious material to be mined out of these verses. My goodness. Um, the, the essence of what we have here is one of the longest warnings that we get in the book of Hebrews. And it's a warning that says, look, do not refuse him who speaks. Because why? Because we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I got to say something about that kingdom which cannot be shaken. Think of all the kingdoms. You can think of the kingdom of education, right? Education. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we're we're proud of um, being educated some way. But watch this. Education is a shakable kingdom because you know what the the, the rapidity whereby information goes out of style these days. You can get a technical degree this year, and in five years, that degree is completely obsolete. Or, you know what? What if you learn all this stuff, and then, God forbid, you get Alzheimer's, and you forget all this stuff? So that's a shakable kingdom. The kingdom of education is a shakable kingdom. What about the kingdom of money, right? What, what if, you know, gee, money will take care of all of my woes, all of my problems. Money is the kingdom that I need to pursue. Well, You've heard pastor say it, money can buy you a house, but it can't buy you a home. Money can buy you a bed, but it cannot buy you a restful night's sleep. Money has its limits. And we can apply this to any kind of kingdom that we come upon. You know, maybe, gee, is it political power? Nope. Gee, is it, uh, is it fame? Is it fortune? Is it power? Nope, 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 nope. The only kingdom that is unshakable is the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to endure. And so anything that we invest in any of these inferior kingdoms, you better be prepared to lose it because time is filled with swift transition. Right there, right? Okay. Now, so the, the, the distinguishing characteristic with respect to these shakable and unshakable kingdoms there are things in this life that are passing. They'll come, but they'll go. Then there are, there's one thing in this life that is permanent, and that's the, the grace and the love of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of that, then we're, we're to serve God with reverence and godly fear. I want to say something about this reverence and godly fear. Because I think we live in a day where, okay, Christianity, I'm just, just saying, across the board, Christianity is not as popular today as it was when I first started out, when, when, when I was a kid. You know, when I was born, um, you know, church attendance and all of that, that, much, much higher than it is today. Today, even among Christians, I'm beginning to have a little concern about the reverence with which we approach divine things. Um, God ain't no joke. God is uh, omnipotent. God, God is all power. And I'm just going to tell you, you don't want to see God's omnipotence. You, you, you don't want to see the might of Almighty God. That's the kind of thing that should, should kindle within us 
what the writer of Hebrews calls godly fear. So I, I don't know, we, we see this in different corners of the church, but the, the notion that God is the, uh, the big guy upstairs, that God is my buddy, my pal, Jesus and I, you know, this and that. Contemporary evangelical theology seems to take what's called the imminence of God, which means the closeness of God, the intimacy of God, the familiarity that we can enjoy with God, seems to overemphasize that. And maybe we don't have the best balance between God's transcendence and God's imminence, that God is indeed as close as our next breath, but God is high and lifted up on the throne. We need to be able to have both of those in balance in our lives to have a, 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 an adequate understanding of God. Yes, God desires to be close to us, but please understand that God also, you know, God's ways are not our ways. God, God's ways are, are high and exalted. So, yes, there's that dimension of imminence, but please, always, whenever we think of the imminence of God, the nearness of God, we also need to understand the transcendence of God, that God is wholly other. One of the big problems with the, uh, the Greek and Roman mythological gods, small g gods, was that all they were was basically taking a human attribute and magnifying it 10,000 times, right? So uh, the god of war, Mars, would just be the, the attribute of kind of a bellicose individual multiplied 10,000 times. God is not just a big person. God is holy, H-O-L-Y, and holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. God is holy, and God is holy other. Now, uh, that's, yeah, I just want, to, just want to underscore that. Now, let's go to the very last verse of Hebrews chapter 12, which says this. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, some, some folk with the, the imminent, intimate notion of God that's not balanced with God's transcendence, they might have trouble. They might stumble over that verse. For our God is a consuming fire. But watch, I want you to under, need to understand something about fire. Fire destroys what it cannot purify. But fire purifies what it cannot destroy. So, fire cannot destroy gold. Can't destroy it. You cannot burn gold gold. Well, uh, technically, okay, if you've got you know, 10 million degrees centigrade and all that kind of business, but, but here on earth, in normal circumstances, gold does not burn. Dross burns up. The impurities burn up. And to say that God is a consuming fire is to say that God is an agent of purification. Fire destroys what it can't purify, and it purifies what it can't destroy. So God is the agent of our purification. What purifies us? The blood of Jesus Christ. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's Hebrews chapter 12. It is a powerful chapter. And it's a chapter that encourages us to keep it going. It's a, a chapter that encourages us not to, uh, you know, not to be waylaid. And let me go back to, uh, to a particular verse here. Verse 3, uh, the second part of verse 3, which says, Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You know, we, we, we must not become weary in well-doing. So lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, be reminded of Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the suffering of the cross. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your encouragement for each and every one of us as we are seeking to live the life that you call us to live. Lord, we know that there will be times when we encounter some, uh, some resistance. Some of that resistance could be e extreme, but we pray, Lord, that even in those days that we would be the recipients of your grace and mercy 
and that we would consider um, consider Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we thank you that you're not done with us yet, that you're still working with each and every one of us as the finisher of our faith. But Lord, we want to be tested and, and approved. We want to be found faithful and, and just um, found that we are lovers of your grace, mercy, and soul. We pray this in the name above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, from St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky, this is Ken Jobst with the Generations Bible Study of St. Stephen Church. It's been great to have you with us. You know what? Be an inviter. Let somebody else know that we're, uh, we're involved in this study. And until next time, when we take a look at Hebrews chapter 13, until then, God bless you. You're in my prayers. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Take care. Bye-bye.